everyone. See the red button below, the subscribe button. Go ahead and press it for me. Thank you so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. If you're enjoying Shannon Confidential podcast episodes and would like to see more, please visit my Patreon account. You'll have access to clips from past episodes, teasers of upcoming episodes, and the ability to submit questions that I will answer to you directly. Thank you so much for your support. Everybody. Welcome to Shannon Confidential. I am Shannon, your host, and Shannon Confidential is a podcast about life, love, and everything in between. And today we will be talking to Truett Taylor. Now he has quite an emotional and yet very inspirational backstory, and I'll let him explain those details, but he is an incredible man. He is a speaker. He is a cancer survivor, and he also has started right in his own garage, a construction company called Taylor Construction and Design. He has a great story, does great things, and a man that actually works with his hands. I can't wait for you to meet him, and he's coming up next. Okay, everybody, here he is, Truett Taylor. He is the man I just talked about. He's got an incredible story. He's doing incredible things, and a man that works with his hands. I love it. So before I go on any further, I would like to thank you, Truett, for being on Shannon Confidential. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really can't wait to everybody hears uh, what you did. Just just everything about you is incredibly interesting and, and just inspiring on so many levels. So tell everybody who you are, your backstory, and, and, and how we are where we are today. Yeah, so I'm Truett Taylor, as Shannon mentions. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've lived in Atlanta, gosh, since 2007. Um, I grew up in a really small town, uh, about an hour and a half of Atlanta called Griffin, Georgia. And um, past has been crazy. Life has been wild, but I absolutely <laughs> love every every single second of it. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I was just thinking the other day about all the life events that I've experienced, and it's just it's wild to to be where I'm at now. But I'm super grateful. And you know, if it was up to me, I probably would have chose a different path. But um, it wasn't my choice, and so here we are. Um, and it's just, it's truly amazing to see all the great things that, that can come out of tragic moments or traumatic moments in life and all the big success and victories you have. If you can just keep pushing forward and, and not give up and, and always be grateful for the situation. Yeah. And you've dealt with quite a bit. I know you're a cancer survivor. Uh, you know, you've had tragedy. And the one thing I have found when I'm interviewing people on the podcast is people have stuff that they've dealt with, whether it be abuse, tragedy, uh, health-related issues. And more and more, I'm seeing people that come back from it stronger, better, uh, taking their new look on life or maybe trying to dive into something they wouldn't have uh, tried to conquer before and paying it forward and, and just using, I don't want to say using, but taking the, the life lesson Person, let's say that they've learned from whatever that tragedy was or that event was that changed their lives and really trying to make it better on the second half. And I think that's, in, that's, that's powerful. It truly is. And um, lots of times it's a, it's a choice that you make. It's, a, it's an intentional choice because we can be defined by the moments in our lives, or we can use those moments to really create a path of success for ourselves and a lesson for other people. There's, as the saying is, it's always easy to learn a lesson that someone else has had to had to walk through versus you learning it yourself. So that's true. You never can prepare for traumatic events most of the time in life. And um, like some of the moments I'm sure we'll talk about today, there was no way I thought at that age I would have experienced those type of moments in life. And yeah, I'm truly grateful for them. And I'm truly grateful that people get a chance to hear stories like this because you have to meet people where they are. And whether they're, you know, not in any kind of traumatic moment now, or they're, dur they're during one, or they're on the opposite side of it, there's a lesson you can take from conversations like this, um, whether you're preparing, whether you're in the middle, or whether you're recovering. And so I think it's great to talk about, especially 
you know, us, you know, being a man, I don't really talk, you know, too much about our feelings as much sometimes. So being able to hear the story from a man who's experienced this, I think can, you know, reach both men and women that are listening to the podcast. I, I agree with you. And I will let you decide how you want to go further on what you, uh, the tragedies and the different life events that you've had to, you know, really get through. And I say get through because there there's grief, there's, uh, you know, health related issues. And uh, even one could have knocked anybody right off their feet. And, and you've dealt with more than one. And I think that makes you incredibly strong. Uh, uh, very relatable, very inspirational. So um, you tell us, Trip, yeah. what are you comfortable talking about? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm open to book to anything. So just kind of yes. laying out like my life, my last 15 years or 20 years of my life. Um, like I said, I grew up in a small town. I decided to uh, kind of be, I was the first one for my family to actually graduate from college. So I kind of broke the pool of my family, moved off to college, went that route. Um, experienced a lot of things through those moments. And leading up until about 2008, I had a pretty good life, I would say, in a lot of ways. Um, growing up, I did have some challenges with, um, I think with my parents were trying to figure some things out in, in life. And just the way, you know, I was raised probably a little tougher than, than most people would, would have been raised, especially probably you know, nowadays for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a very, very tough, um, emotional, I would say, like, um, you know, kind of very strict environments, um, not a lot of wiggle room, high moral value on everything, but not a lot of room for error, I would say, in our household. And so that was one of those things that I've had to kind of lighten myself up a little bit from like a load of that pressure of always doing the right thing and trying to be perfect and all those things. We all have a tape recorder in our head with a message <laughs> from our childhood. And so that's something that even today, I still kind of have to go back and, and tape over sometimes as I go through experiences, but life was going great. I graduated from college. I landed a great job in, the, in Atlanta. And I remember we, we was March, um, early March, um, of 2008. I was sitting in a meeting with um, my like a sales meeting at work and you know it's very rare that someone ever interrupted those meetings. Well I had our receptionist come and in there and to talk to me and, and you know the things that she shared with me that day you know the, the phone call I had that day definitely forever changed my life. Um, earlier that month um, my father was in a really terrible motorcycle accident. Uh, I was actually on my way to visit him. It was, it was very, I think that phone call was actually later in March, but the, the, the original event, I was headed to my father's house to see him for just an event. And my dad, mainly man, Harley riding kind of guy, um, was on the way back from the grocery store and had a motorcycle accident that actually threw him from his motorcycle and he landed on the top of his head. And- oh, gosh. We found out later that day he was airlifted to a hospital in Tennessee. You know, the most manly, big, strong guy you've ever seen in your life was all of a sudden paralyzed from the neck down. I am so and, sorry. Oh. Yeah. So just seeing that, seeing your father not being able to say words because his lungs aren't working correctly because of the spinal cord injury and pointing to letters on a chart while you see his father in the same room, you know, crying over the whole traumatic event, that was definitely a catalyst for all these life events that were going to happen in the future. And so, you know, that happened early March. And then um, a couple of weeks later, when I was in the sales meeting and I got the phone call, um, it was from our receptionist. And she's like, your mother's on the phone and she wants to talk to you. And the first thought in my head was, you know, she's going to tell me my father had passed away based on the, the accident that he had. And I was mm -hmm. sort of prepared for that in a way. But um, her exact words were, you know, true, I don't know how to tell you this, but your brother just took his own life this morning. And um, those moments, I'm that so moment, sorry. yeah, I, it's crazy. Like in, in traumatic events, moments you can still remember. I remember how I was sitting at the desk, what I was wearing, the location I was in. And just hearing those words, and that's not 
anything that anyone could have ever imagined if you were to see like my brother he was a big strong guy as well too life of the party kind of person um never in a million years gave off any idea that he had anything going on um but yeah so having that phone call there you know so in that same month that was that was a pretty tough month for our family and then so leaving work and going down and you know going through that whole process seeing you know your sisters uh, seeing you know your mother when she's lost a child and then we had to all go tell my father a couple of days later when he was in the hospital i can't um, even imagine yeah so that those moments you know at, at at that point in life were definitely something i wasn't prepared for in a lot of ways you know being late like mid mid 20s late 20s how old i was and i can't remember the moment but um having to experience that that loss and the thing about my brother's death was um siblings fight we we, we fight we get over it we make up you know that's just what siblings do a week prior to his death we had gotten a really bad argument and that was our last conversation that we had with each other and so there has been a lot of guilt from that moment and so working through that guilt and we can talk about that as well too like just being able to work through the guilt of having those conversations there's no better way to learn a lesson sometimes than having to really learn it the hard learn way it. and um that was a hard lesson for me from a relationship standpoint number one is our words are are so powerful and so strong they give you know they give life and then they can you know give death as well too by what we say and so it just taught me a lesson moving forward, you know, just the, the, be careful with what you say that you could be your last conversation. There's all the, you know, th taking things for granted and, and all that as well too, but really, you know, you, you can't wait. I think lots of times when you have, you know, I see so many siblings that have been, have haven't talked to each other for months or years or, or people in their family. I promise you, like if, if you need to make that phone call today, that is a call you need to make. Um, because you never know. And then once it happens, like, and they're not there to, to have that conversation with, there is a lot of guilt that comes along with that. And it's a lot to work with on top of losing someone that you're really close to. So those two big events happen, like I said, within a month. And it was, it was a very, man, there's just, there's just so much that went along with that from a, a growing standpoint. And, you know, what do you do when you go back to work? And, people asking you questions and not knowing how to respond to traumatic events, that in itself um, can be traumatic. The more, you know, when you finally, it's been 30 or 45 minutes and you haven't thought about the event and someone comes up and says, well, how are you doing? Then all of a sudden you're thinking about the same thing again. And, you know, just going to funerals and, and all that stuff as well. Um, again, it, it, it's a lot on someone um, whenever you have to experience moments like that. And so that happened in 2008. Um, I actually got married in 2010. Um, and it was one of those things, I think, at the time, um, success and you know, life events and all that stuff are really important to me. And I felt like I went out on a limb and maybe got married to check a box in my life in a way. It's like a, you know, having a relationship. Yeah. yeah, going out and doing that. And unfortunately, the person um, that I was married to didn't work out with us. And, um, you know, within like two years, our relationship fell apart. And, um, but so that was definitely now I'm like, okay, great. Now my life resume is starting to go downhill, right? Like you're, you're thinking of all these things that you've experienced. And then in, um 2012 I was always real competitive with sports and stuff I played baseball my whole life I've always enjoyed you know training weight training and um I got into like amateur Muay Thai fighting as well too and so I had competed what is that Muay Thai fighting it's um I would say for most people it's like UFC fighting without being on the ground and wrestling and like the jiu-jitsu side of everything it's more of the striking side of fighting so <laughs> Um, Ooh, not me, but <laughs> yeah, punching, kicking, knees, elbows, things like that. Okay. Um, but that, but again, I love competition, and there's nothing more real than standing across the ring from someone and um, someone saying go, and then you figuring out who's who's the toughest in a couple of rounds. So, wow, but, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty intense. 
So I was having some lower pain in my left abdomen. And I was like, man, maybe I've got kicked real hard or something along those lines, 2012. And I had to get down to a certain weight to make a certain fight that I was going to. And I was, wasn't able to gain the weight back afterwards. And I was like, what is going on? And so I made an appointment with a GI doctor to, just to kind of be checked out with everything. Okay. And he's like, hey, worst case scenario, you have Crohn's disease. And I was like, oh, no, a disease. I've never had a cavity before. And now <laughs> who thinks I have a disease? So I was preparing for that. I was like, you know, consulting Dr. Google like we all do. Oh, yeah. You know, with all, you know, symptoms and whatever it may have. And I was like, man, that sounds like what I have. Well, he uh, ordered a colonoscopy for me. And I remember laying in there and they were like, why are you here? You don't look like most of the patients that are in here. Because you were like, oh. young. Yeah, I was 31 years old. Yeah. And, um, you usually have a colonoscopy to your 45, 50, 50 years old. Yeah. So I was like, let's do it, you know, see what happens. Well, I woke up from the colonoscopy and I'll never forget that his words, his exact words. And I can still hear him saying it is, hey, today's not going to be a good day for you you have a large tumor inside your colon. I'm pretty sure it's cancer. And I couldn't even get the scope past the size of the tumor. Oh my goodness, Truett. <sighs> yeah. 31 years old, having colon cancer is extremely rare and no family history, no bad environment, no bad health issues, no signs, no symptoms other than what I was presenting when I went in. And here I am 31 years old, and all of a sudden I have to go through this situation. And you just a, had to feel like so many times in your life, the ground just kept getting whipped out and whipped out. And you're just like, come on. It did. And like it's early in the year, like was when I was officially like divorced. So I felt like a big failure from a relationship standpoint. And here I am six months later to get diagnosed with cancer. And, you know, not only am I going to have to go through cancer, I'm going to have to go through it by myself because I don't have a spouse. Partner or support. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and then what, the thing that bothered me the most, I would say, I, I, I didn't know anything about cancer. Being competitive, you think you can go in and just beat something and whatever else, but you find out really quick that it has nothing to do with how competitive you are. Um, one of the things that bothered me the most just getting my cancer diagnosis was the fact that my mother could lose another child. Oh, and, wow. and I remember I just bought a house that year as well too. So it was only me living in this big house by myself. And I'm thinking like, wow, like here I am, you know, in this house. And, you know, I would literally like cry myself to sleep at night sometimes thinking, you know, if my mother has to bury another child, like what is that going to be like for her? <sighs> And you, you hear like the one of the worst things that can happen to anyone in, in life is for a parent to lose a child and for her to lose two children. I think that's, that's a lot to ask of someone. Anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was one of the inspirations for myself as well, too, because there's a lot of moments where you walk into the mirror after you, you know, being diagnosed with cancer, I had surgery, chemo, radiation, um, and more chemo afterwards that you look in the mirror and you don't even recognize yourself. You lost all this weight, your hair, your nails, everything is weird. Like it's you're, brutal on you. It's brutal. Yeah. And I'm like, so I'm 30 pounds lighter and I'm staring at the person in the mirror and like, wow, I don't even recognize you. And there's moments that you really like, you wonder if that's it. And you wonder, you know, and then you start thinking of, for me, like, I was like, well, I'm not going to get to this in life. I'm not going to get to have this or experience this. You know, these people will be gone and, and all of that. And you really can get into a dark space in life when you start thinking about all those things. I'm like, okay, you know, well, as if I'm like praying, I'm like, you know, God, is it, why me? Why, why all of this on me in the past five years? I'm and, sure that's a question you had to ask yourself a lot over those past five years. Why? It was. And the medicine they were giving me was causing insomnia too. And though, so that's a form of torture in itself. Like, you had no break, no mental break whatsoever. None. I remember, you know, going, lying in bed and waking up and not being asleep for six, seven hours and then having to stay up the whole day. And it's, it just becomes like a real mind game. And 
it's crazy to, to, to have to experience that. And the more you're left alone, the more you're left within your thoughts. And so you start creating these fantasies that can become realities for you. And then you find yourself living a life and experiencing moments that aren't even happening based out of fear and worry. And yes. there was a moment that um, for myself and my family, our faith is really important. And right when I was diagnosed, I had um, my mother, she had written um, a scripture and she said, hey, keep this around for you. It's, it's really important um, for you. And um, the scripture said, I will not die, but live and declare the works of God. And so that was on the piece of paper that I had in my bathroom. Beautiful. And um, so I remember one of my worst moments where I'm like throwing up and sick and I had to go home with a chemo pump attached to me that made noise all night. It was stuck in a port in my chest. So I had to sleep on my back, like in one spot the whole night. And I got up and I was just remember looking at myself directly in the mirror thinking, what, you know, what's going to happen from here? And as I was doing that, when my hand had touched like this piece of paper laying on my, on my sink and the piece of paper was the scripture my mother had wrote for me. And at that moment, it was just a reminder that, you know, I don't have a choice whether I live or die. Like that's, I can try my hardest. This chemo may not work. You know, this, this situation, you know, may not work out in general because no matter what, I mean, I had the same type of cancer Chadwick Bozeman had, and he had all the care he could possibly get. And we had the same diagnosis and he didn't make it. So it's, mm. it's, it doesn't matter. And, um, but for me, it was a reminder that, you know, in my life, and this is, you know, regardless of, of what your beliefs are, this is something that was really important to me that it was just a reminder to me that this wasn't going to be the thing that took me out. And, um, and, I, and I held on to that promise. And when, when I started holding on to that promise, I started seeing, I started really looking for good things to happen and looking for moments of inspiration because I, I really feel like you you always find what you're looking for and if I was looking for sadness if I was looking for a reason to be upset or a reason to be just down for the day I was going to find that in the mirror but if I was looking for moments of happiness moments of gratitude moments of inspiration I was going to find that as well too and so from that moment on anytime I was you know, going through insomnia or had moments and stuff, you know, I would really focus in on, you know, that promise that I wasn't going to live. And not only, not, that I was not going to die, but not only was I going to die, but I was going to be able to tell everybody all the great things like God had done for me through a lot of different avenues. And so here we are. This is actually my 10 year cancer anniversary in, in July. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Here we are 10 years later. And I've been on numerous podcasts sharing stories and all sorts of other things that we've had outlets to, to be able to share all the great things that have happened in life since that moment. And so for me, it's just a fulfilled promise. And, and I couldn't be more grateful to, to share the story, the ups and the downs. And because that was the rough part of my life. There's from here on, from, from that point on has been absolutely, you know, exceptional. And I have a lot of great positive stories and positive moments to share from that moment on so um but just for anyone that is experiencing cancer or go or has a loved one through that um i had started a podcast several years ago where i interviewed cancer warriors cancer survivors and even caregivers as well too and providers and through that journey of, of interviewing people there's a couple of things that really stood out to me on how to treat someone that's going through an illness because I remember people ask, I don't know why this was the, the, the conversation, but people would come to you and say, Oh, what kind of cancer do you have? And I would tell them and their immediate response would be like, Oh, my grandmother had that. She passed away. I'm like, that's the last <laughs> thing. Yeah. Like way to inspire me for today. But I think lots of times when we, when people have traumatic events, whether it's, you know, divorce or cancer or whatever else, we try to relate by putting ourselves in a situation. It never really helps. Um, I would say if you could just get in the trenches with that person, 
And it, sometimes it's just listening. Sometimes it's cleaning their house. Sometimes it's taking them to the doctor. Sometimes it's sitting there watching the movie. Whatever they need is is what they need. They don't need you to be like a hero. And you know, it does. They don't. They shouldn't have to worry about how you're feeling whenever they're going through you know a traumatic moment like that. Um, we as human beings, it's, it's really easy for us to be selfish. I know I've, I've been like that myself for in a lot of different ways. But being truly selfless around someone who is experiencing a tougher moment in life is the right approach. So it's good anybody, advice. It's very good. Yeah, anybody that's listening, like that's just a reminder if you have someone going through a traumatic event in their life right now, which we all know someone probably going through struggles, just be there for that person on what they need and what level they need you to be on. Again, whether it's something very small or if they really need something big for you, it's, it should be all about them while they're going through that moment. Well, thank you for taking the time to say that because I know that anybody listening can relate in some way with, with dealing with somebody that's going through something. And that is probably the best positive, honest message I have ever heard anybody say. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. That'll, that'll benefit somebody. Thank you. For sure. So yeah, life since then, man, it's been, it's been a wild ride too. Like in, in, a, in a truly positive life, you can't, you know, when, when you see someone, when, I, when I've had, and I get it all the time, when people look at me, they don't, they can't tell the, tra the trauma or they can't tell the, the events that I've experienced, whether it's, you know, physically, whether it's emotionally or mentally. Um, that's something that I've, I've really been intentional on uh, when it came back to getting my health back. When I got finished taking all my chemo treatments, I literally could not carry my groceries up the stairs. I would sit down like halfway through carrying my groceries up the stairs. And so, you know, it was important for me to really get back into shape. And so I did that. And then um, just, I was healthy before. So it was just at that big crash. Yeah. So I didn't want my physical body to represent someone who had had cancer before if as much as I possibly could. So it was important for me to, you know, get my strength back and, you know, take care of myself and, and really display, hey, this is the, the battle that I experienced. I have scars from that battle, but look where I'm at now, like bigger, faster, stronger than I was before. Yeah. And when you you were saying, you know, if someone looks at you, they, they can't tell just by looking at you that you have suffered great loss in your family uh, at a young age that you had dealt with, you know, a marriage that didn't, make it, you know, you had to go your separate ways. Then you have to deal with cancer. You're not, and what I'm gathering is you're not saying people can't see that because you're somehow hiding it or, or ashamed in any way. You've just learned how to use that to make you stronger now. And that's why people can't see it. You've, you've grown from it. Yeah. I really dug into all of the emotions that come with trauma. It's really easy when you go through the grief cycle to get stuck in one part of that cycle and, and blame you, and blame and you become, and you, it's like anything else. You, you create a habit to create a barrier around where you're stuck in the grief cycle. Sometimes, whether it's acceptance, whether it's anger, whatever it is, you you justify you being angry because like, you know, how dare you like, you know, God, why'd you do all this to me? I, I could have those moments and, and, be, and be like that. But that's just me being stuck in them. And I, and I did have those moments. Those are all valid. They're normal. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we only have so much understanding of, of, of life and, and what we're doing. But um, not being stuck in that moment, really working through like, okay, this is how I feel. Is this normal? Talk to someone. Um, talk to a, someone. Absolutely. A group of friends, a, a medical professional, a, you know, someone that you can be open and honest with and really working through all those feelings. That was important for me. I mean, just it's someone that I, it's, it's, it's weird. Like the grief that I have from the conversation, my last conversation with my brother, I almost a total stranger said, Hey, you know what? Your brother would have forgave you and y'all would have been okay. Like a week later. And that, in saying that, I'm like, you know what, you're right. And so it was helped me get past that moment of, you know, holding all this guilt in. And then yeah. even being a cancer survivor, there's a survivor's guilt that comes along with that as well, too. When I'm talking to people or when I meet people now in my profession that, you know, may have lost someone to cancer, 
And I'm like, why yeah. cancer? And here I, you know, here I am still here, you know, it's a yeah, lot. Yeah, you kind of, you, you, you want to say, wow, I fought my way back. And at the same time, you're like, well, I don't want to, you know, I feel bad that they lost somebody. I got to kind of not say anything. Yeah. And then, but at the end of the day, like, like our, our days are truly numbered and there's no, we don't know, you know, no one knows what that number is and when it's going to be. And, you know, every moment that I'm here, I just want to be really intentional with all my relationships. I would say like a, having a failed marriage is something that, again, it's, it's nothing for, for me personally that I was proud of. And, you know, it's not the easiest thing to talk about now. I don't want to talk bad about anybody in the past or anything like that, but it's any tragic, any tragedy or any kind of moment in life. I got, like I said earlier, I didn't want that on my life's resume. And now if I look back at my life resume, all these challenging moments and events are just preparing me for something even greater because I've experienced and I've gotten I believe that. Yeah. And so what I thought was going to make me look bad and people would judge you for like, cause trying to date again, someone's like, well, I don't I remember once the person told me, well, I don't want to date someone who's ever been divorced. I'm like, Oh, like, well, for, yeah. That person's going to be alone for a long time. Right. <laughs> um, dodge the bullet there. But, um, but yeah, so it, it's all those things that people try to get or someone that, don't doesn't want to date you because what if his cancer comes back and he dies and we have kids and all this? I mean, I've had all that stuff said to me before. It's horrible, it's horrible, isn't it? But that's that's, that's just horrible. No, but that's 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 what's out there sometimes. But, wow. Um, yeah, but all those moments again are, are are trying to pull you back into the negativity of those moments when you know if you truly look at it, like you can learn so much from from those events, but. As human beings, we're all on this earth, like just specifically made with all these different gifts and talents and all the things that we have. We're all individuals and all have different walks of life, but we're all made to connect with each other. We're not here to be alone. So any kind of experience that I have, maybe it connects with someone else who will connect with someone else. And we're all here for each other. And, you know, you- I believe that. Yeah, you hate to see- you know, sometimes the state of the world where we're so polarized on one belief or party or whatever else, when it's just, it's just a, almost like a trick in a way to get us to disconnect when we all can be connected. So much stronger together. Yes. Whether we agree or disagree on moments, I have the most eclectic group of friends from all walks of life, all religions. Um, And if you saw us all together, it looks like a, like a, (laughs) A big melting pot of people. That's really. I love the, that. Yeah, that's where you learn the most from people who are different from you. Yes. And you have a respect for, for other people. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity to learn and grow from cultures and ideas that you may not even viewpoints. Know. Exactly. Yeah, the, I, we're we're never. I don't think we ever stop learning. We just have to be willing to constantly continue learning. That's the choice people need to make, you know, learn, learn from everything, be a sponge to everything around you. It just makes you stronger it, mentally, physically, emotionally. I, I, that's just what I believe. That's my opinion. Yeah. Each situation can either teach you or remind you. That's the way I look at life. I like don't, that. Don't need to be reminded of A, B, and C today, or am I getting taught lessons? And then once you really kind of hone into that, you can feel like in the beginning, okay, I'm being taught just like, you know, if I'm going through a certain experience with my career, I know I'm learning. And then other moments are just reminding me of things maybe that have happened in the past. And so, I'm, again, we're always open to that. And that's where vulnerability and ego kind of come in as well, too. Um, the more vulnerable you are, the less, less ego you have. And I think it's great to be confident and, you know, alpha male, all the things like that. But, you know, have vulnerability as well, too, when it comes down to, to working with other people and then even being, you know, in relationships as well. Yeah, and I don't necessarily think confidence, and this is where I think a lot of people get it wrong. People think a confident person has a massive ego. I, I don't think the two are the same. Now, you can be cocky and be not a nice person and you have a really big ego, but a confident person that's not a bad quality. I find it a, an incredible strength. Now, your attitude might be something different, but your confidence, being proud of yourself and knowing that you're good at something or 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 just being like 
like the sex, I, you know, I don't know, you, you want to match, you're confident about your ability to fight, or you build something, you know, with your furniture line, that, that confidence, that pride, that's where I see confidence, very pride, very proud of yourself for what you've been able to accomplish, do, see, read, what have you. I don't see that as ego. And I think that's where people misjudge people sometimes. Yeah, there's a peace in selfless confidence, I would say. Yeah. Um, when it becomes selfish, then that's where the attitude comes in, I think, lots of times as well. So that's just a that's a daily reminder though, because it's it's human nature to be selfish and survivalistic and you know, try to get as much as you can or do as much as you can, especially if you're a, a more driven entrepreneur type person. Um, but it's a daily reminder to be selfless because everybody's in a different position and any successful team, you, you can't have everyone play the same position. So if you've got a leader, you know, you, if, I'm, if I'm the pitcher, you know, one day and then I have a first baseman or a shortstop or whatever else, utility players that I need, that's who I want around me. Um, and, you know, to, to, to lead a group, to lead a team, um, and, and, you know, whatever else, you really have to figure out where you fit in and then, you know, sometimes you take turn with leadership. Sometimes, you know, you're the tip of the spear and you go first. You're the cavalier in the group. And then that's your role. But um, I think it all depends on, you know, your dreams and your desires. That's what really pushes people, um, especially entrepreneurs. I think, you know, we're, a, we're definitely a special breed of people. And um, people say you were born with it or you're not. I think mm. you can it's, it's, it's either way. I think it's nature and nurture in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, you can have that desire, but never do anything about it. And those are the people that want to start the business, but you know, they say the same thing five years later and they don't start their business or their podcast or whatever. Usually else. some type of fear. Exactly. Yeah. Always fear. It's always a fear. Yeah. What some fear. Have. Yeah. When it's perfect, that's when I'll start. That's always the best. Well, it's never going to be perfect. So <laughs> yeah. So, too. Yeah. Yeah. You, and going what you were just talking about, you definitely decided to take all of that past and use it to move forward. I did. Um, so I went back to work finally. And after all the cancer situation that I experienced, and um, I used to, to work in the, I was a director of admissions over a couple of different schools throughout my education career in the Atlanta area. And I, the last school I was at was a technical school. And I got to be around a bunch of uh, like technical trade workers, basically. And so my father was an electrician. Um, so I grew up around that. But I, I was a biology man. I have a couple of biology degrees. So I went a complete opposite. From, I was kidding. Very you know, different. Very different, yeah. Um, but I always respected the trades. That's why I, in my childhood, that's what I grew up doing with my father most of the time. But I remember when I was, you know, at the end of my career in education, really feeling like I was getting called to do something else because what would happen like every couple of years I would go to different schools and kind of help rescue them and get them back up and going and successful and I just felt like every two or three years I was going to be doing that somewhere else and I got offers to go to different states and I just didn't know if I wanted to do that I felt like I was just kind of being called to, to go in a different route so I actually um, met my wife um, in 2016 and the crazy way we met, I actually got a phone call from my doctor because every six months I would have to go for a, a CT scan and they thought my cancer had came back in my liver. They just had a, a bump, like a nod or nodule on my liver and they wanted to, to look at it. And she's like, hey, I just want to prepare you. It looks like your cancers came back. Here's the treatment plan going forward. And I was so crushed by it. And, um, you know, became like a serial dater in the, in, the, in the Atlanta area. And so I had, uh, dated someone who had a friend um, who we somehow were connected through social media in some kind of way. And the girl's name was Claire. And so Claire was, uh, she lived in Alabama and I never met her before, but her friend had talked about me a little bit. I had been on a couple of dates with. And Claire was uh, a part of a, a, a church in Alabama and Anyways, I don't know what it was, but um, when I thought my cancer came back, I kind of kept it close to a couple of people. I didn't want to go tell everyone because, 
you know, part all of all over again. It's here we go again. Like, oh man, like you know, I don't want everyone feeling sorry for me if I had to go through that situation again. So I reached out to a couple of different people. I was like, hey, Claire, I don't really know you so well. Um, you know, do you mind like, you know, you go praying for me for your, with your church, you know, because there's a situation that I'm going through right now. And she's like, yeah, absolutely. And then that was kind of it. And so we had maybe had like two or three conversations after that on the telephone. I wasn't flirting. I wasn't like in the mood to flirt at the moment or anything. Um, but I had my, uh, the spot biopsy on my liver and it came back, no cancer. And so I made two phone calls. First call was to my mother and I said, hey, guess what? Um, you know, bad, bad news. Nope, it's good news. Here's the situation. And for some reason, the second call I made was to Claire. I was like, hey, I, I appreciate you having, you know, you guys praying for me, having the conversations with me, kind of yeah, you know, whatever else. And um, then I was like, okay, I have like a complete license to flirt with this girl now. So <laughs> um, we went on a couple of dates and hit it off. And then in the August of the following year, we were engaged and then we were married in January of 2017. And um, oh, congratulations. That's yeah. a sweet story. Yeah, it's been great. And um, man, when you, we did a lot of things differently, I would say than, than most people in a relationship and uh, really tried to, to be disciplined in our relationship in a lot of ways. And um, man, it's, it's, it's really paid off, but you know, in 2017, I told her, I was like, Hey, I've got this great job, but I'm, I'm going to quit my job and you know, go do something else and work from home. Like, and basically make fern in my garage, turn my hobby into a passion and into a career basically. And so she's like, okay, well, she, she was a travel nurse at the time. And so she decided to quit travel nursing and go back to nurse practitioner school. So I was like, real cool. We're going to be real broke for the next couple of years, <laughs> you know, figure this out. And, um, we were, it was, it's, it's, it's crazy. Whenever you go from a every two week paycheck, 401k insurance to, oh my gosh, I just made a hundred dollars this week. You know, like that's a real big wake up call on, you know, your savings and how you spend money. And there's moments where there's a moment that we had actually videoed this, where we had $13 in our checking account and hadn't bought groceries yet. And, um, but so I started a, a furniture company out of my garage and it grew really quick. I would say I started it in August and by October I had a, some like 18 year old kid found me on Instagram and said he wanted to come work with me out of my garage. So we were making furniture together. I love that. Yeah. And then a couple months later, I outgrew the garage and moved into a, a, a larger warehouse and then it multiplied from there. And um, that was in 2017. And today it's you know, 2022, 20, right? And um, I run a multi-million dollar construction <laughs> company. So it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of crazy how, how fast things can happen. Um, I, I have to ask though, you, okay, so you're working with schools, you were into biology, right? And then you decide I'm going to walk away from everything and I'm going to build furniture, which is yeah. great. Personally, I think people working with their hands is a lost art. I don't care if you're fixing watches or building furniture, doing something with your hands is a lost art. What, did you have any experience in that? Or were you just like, yeah, let me see if I can put a table together. Like, how did you choose building furniture? I know if you were to write this down, nothing makes sense. From like <laughs> anything. But um, when I first bought my house, I... Um, I just wanted to make the furniture for it. And so I just got on YouTube and started learning how to make furniture from YouTube. And um, it's incredible. Am I? Yeah. And I bought a saw and I annoyed all my neighbors at first. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was in a, living in a town home actually. And so, yeah, I annoyed all my neighbors for a couple of months on the, on the weekends. And then I went just full all the way into it. And um, yeah, it's wild how, how fast, things took off. Um, we went from making Obviously you were good at what you built that it took off so fast. You know, if your table kind of was crooked or collapsed, you probably wouldn't have gone so well. I think about some of the things and I really, I want to apologize if I made you furniture in the very beginning, <laughs> but, um, the attention to detail, I think I just became obsessed with the details and you see that you can see that in work and in craftsmanship. Yeah. And so the hours that you put into that and the knowledge of learning and I didn't realize how 
the corporate world had conditioned me to survive every day. And I was probably not, I definitely wasn't using all the potential that I had, like mentally, I would say, you know, you get to like this cruise control at work where you're going through the motions, you can do an eight hour job in four hours. And then what am I going to do for those other four hours? Um, that's kind of, I've been on that for a little while. So just going through, just being an entrepreneur and, in itself it's very scary there's so many moments and so many nights i would wake up and get on linkedin and apply for like 10 jobs because i was like mm-hmm. I can't be broke and you know all these other things that were going to happen and my wife just taught me out she's like just don't don't do that because i started getting I actually went on interviews thinking like okay i just you know i'm gonna get my dream job i'm gonna go into this field is what i always wanted to do and i would get offered jobs and i would just turn them down I'm like okay don't you're wasting everybody's time stop going on these job interviews and go all in and just 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 jump out, get your wings on the way down, big leap of faith into this Love career. It. And once you go all in on something, whether it's a relationship or a career, that's when you're going to get the most out of it. That's when you're going to expose all of your, you know, your fears and your weaknesses. And the faster you can work through those with opportunity, the better you're going to get. And that was, I just became obsessed with opportunity whether it's making a new piece of furniture, whether it's working with a new client, because not only are you making furniture, you're having to sell it and you're having to market yourself and you're You're learning everything. And you're having to, you know, it's easier when you're working with someone else's money when I was working in education, but Mm -hmm. now it's like every penny, you know, where it's at. And then how am I investing in it? Then you have, you know, I've always led larger teams, but now I have a smaller team. And so it's, there's a challenge in that as well too. And, you're you know, teaching them as you're learning. You're yeah. learning and teaching at the same time. If I'm unsuccessful as a business, then that's four families that aren't going to eat. So there's a responsibility that comes with that as well, too. And so just growing, um, just really developing a process was really important for me because, like, okay, you've got a talent, you've got a skill set. Um, that's great. But a lot of people in the con- design build community. Um, aren't the best at business in a lot of ways. They're creative or they can, you know, go that route, but actually running a business and going through that part of the process and taxes and all those things that come with that payroll and leadership and empowering, you know, all this, a lot of those things I learned from my previous career. And so I just had to pick up the skill set and, and the current career I'm in now. And so I was able to combine both of those things together with my, my passion for people, just as much as I enjoy renovating a 6,000 square foot house, I enjoy watching, you know, a coworker of mine, you know, have enough money to go on vacation with their family. So that, that's just as equal to me. That's so, beautiful. Thank you. So that's a, that's a passion of mine to see people be successful. And, you know, there's a quote that you, you know, if you help enough people get what they want, you're going to get what you want. And that's, that's my desire my dream is to help as many people as I possibly can get what they want and um and I'll always be taken care of on my end and um that's that's what I've established and we were you know really kind of wrote a process um we call it the dig process for us I love this explain that so it's weird I, my wife had went out of town and I don't know how everybody is but when your wife goes out of town or your spouse is out of town like you have all of a sudden this like burst of energy free moments where you're just only you know you don't have to worry about anybody else sometimes so like as men you know we sit on the couch and relax and you watch what we want whatever and stuff um but it's like this idea got downloaded into my head and i grabbed a piece of paper and i started writing 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 and i was done and i came up with like a three-step process uh, like a culture for my company and something that I've taught in a lot of ways when it comes down to people, entrepreneurs being successful. And we call it the DIG process. Um, D stands for discipline. So any, you can, you can have discipline in any area of life, whether it's getting up on time, whether it's what you're putting into your body, it's any kind of discipline that you may have of following a set of rules, sacrifice comes with discipline a lot. So establishing some sort of discipline in your life. All of my coworkers that work with me, you know, we, there's one area of their life where there's probably needs to be a little more discipline in, whether it's what they eat or how they, yeah. you know, 
spend their money or whatever else and stuff. So we focus on that area because that's going to make them stronger working with me and my team. So discipline is number one. Intentionality is where the eye comes in. So every, every discipline you have, there has to be a, an intentional action behind it. So when I, you know, go meet with the clients or when I hire someone or when I make a decision, I'm intentionally doing that. I'm thinking and focusing in on that intentional decision, whether it's me building out a kitchen or a home or whatever the process may be, I'm being intentional with all of my actions. And it's so easy to just go with the flow and next thing you know, it's five years later and you're in the same spot. Yeah. You're really intentional with your actions. You are on a purposeful plan. And so that was really important for me to combine that discipline and intention, which you see that in a, in a lot, like in a corporate America, I see that a lot. Like you see like the, the people that are disciplined that show up on time, get their work yeah. done, are intentional. You can move through ranks. What is missing in a lot of, in a lot of corporate settings is the G part of our process. And that's the gratitude part. So yes. Yeah, you can be disciplined, you know, show up and do what you're supposed to do and then intentional on knowing how to do it and why you're doing it. But if there's no gratitude involved, you're not going to enjoy it as much. You, and take the, you put that selflessness in. Absolutely. And so a, a process that we talk about a lot with my company is when we are driving into work, you know, I'll tell everyone like you're going to however you think about your day, you're kind of, you're going to get started like that. So if you can think of three or four things you're grateful for on the way into work, you are already hardwiring your brain because I could show up in an awful situation at work. Like you could have a catastrophe at work or someone has a personal conflict or something that's going on, or if I meet, you know, my situation, if I have a client who's tough to deal with, or if we have a plumbing leak in the middle of the night, whatever it's going to be, you have, the, you have those situations. But if I go into that, you know, being grateful and, and being, you know, whether it's me being grateful for my coworkers, grateful for the opportunity, you know, grateful for the challenges, like yeah. you're telling yourself that gratitude goes a long ways. And I, it really felt like that was one of the key things that was missing in my corporate environment. It was do as much as you can, as fast as you can, and you're just as good as you were yesterday. Yeah. You, weren't, you weren't good, then we'll get somebody else to be better than you. And so that's a, that's a, I just do, I just wanted to be off that, that hamster wheel and I wanted to create that environment. And so whenever we do have moments of challenge, which happens a lot when, when you're doing home renovations, that gratitude comes in as like a, your emotional bank accounts are as a little already full with grace a little bit on situations and clients see that your coworkers see that. And as a leader, that's what I always want to bring into my group as well, because it trickles down to them, which trickles down to my client and situations and stuff. So we really talk about like the dig process a lot. And there's a lot of different ways you can dive into that even more into each, into each section of that. Yeah. But just as an overall view, that's something that's really important for me. And that's something that anytime we have a new team member come on, it's important for them to really understand that process and become part of that, because that's what's really you know, to, to go from, you know, and it's honestly happened in the past couple of years from, from making hundreds of dollars a year to over a million dollars a year as a company, like in a very short time, it's kind of wild. It doesn't happen that often. So, no. and it's great people, great opportunities, but you can squander, you can get, you can lose great people and you can squander great opportunities. But if you have a great process with those other two things, it tends to take you you know, up. Like in the elevator instead of the stairs kind of situation. So I think it's a beautiful message. Yeah, that's where we're at now and everything's going really well. And, um, you know, I couldn't be more excited now that we're kind of post pandemic and <laughs> we're talking to people and uh, <laughs> hands and hugging and everything else and stuff, hopefully, you know, yeah, but having great conversations like this. And, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's really important. That's why I love doing podcasts, love talking to people like you because you're sharing other people's messages and getting the word out. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I think it's absolutely wonderful. So, um, it's great. And you, you're talking about podcasts. You have one as well. I do. Yeah. I started a, a podcast called 1% podcasts. Probably Tell five, us about that. Yeah. It's five years ago where I would interview, interview cancer warriors, survivors, caregivers, and to offer them inspiring messages of hope, 
tell their stories. Um, I've met some of the most amazing people in my life. And some of the most amazing people I've met are the ones that have it, have the worst situations. And, um, you know, it doesn't make sense. How can you live your best life when you're having the, the worst situation? And there's an energy and there's a power in that. And I always wanted to share that with other people because, you know, and I'll use this as an example. Like if, I, if I'm working with a client and they have four bathrooms in their home and they can't use one of them, I was like, yeah, first of all, you've got three more. But in my head, I'm like, you don't have cancer. You don't have all these things that have happened to you, that right? So, so much worse. <laughs> yeah, life could be so much worse than you're not using like one specific bathroom in your home. So like, that's, that's what we want to get the podcast out for is to be able to share those stories with people. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of great people and a lot of people I've interviewed aren't here with us anymore. And so I think it's great. Their loved ones can go back and listen to those messages as well, too. So um, is it still on? Yeah, it's still on. Okay. Um, and you can go to 1percentpodcast.com and or anywhere you check out podcasts are all on, you know, all those outlets and stuff for us as well, too. Yeah, and I'll make sure everybody, um, everything that Truett has talked about today, his construction company, his podcast, um, anything Truett related, even contacting him will all be below us in the show notes. So I'll make sure you are able to link up with him like that and um, just be involved, order furniture, listen to his podcast, you know, anything. This You're truly just an incredible human being with a story that almost everybody in the world can relate to in, in some way. And just to stay so positive and keep rising up and keep getting better and better and better, the universe just has a freaky way of working itself out when you allow it. Absolutely. And just being authentic wherever you're at in the process. I think that's that goes a long way. Whether you, you're talking on a podcast, whether you're having a conversation with people, people really recognize and respect authenticity. And if you're having a bad day, you know, have that bad day. If you're having a great day, like, you know, enjoy that moment as well too. Um, sometimes I, I look down at my hands and they're a little dirtier now than they normally are. Um, but you, you think about all of the things that your hands have touched in your life and, you know, whether, whether you've, you know, held the, the, the casket of your, your brother that passed away or held the hand of a dying, you know, relative or, you know, for me, like signed divorce papers or all the things that you can think of that are tough that you've done like with your hands. And you think of all the great things like sliding a ring on someone's finger and promising them and, you know, holding hands in the movies or, or, you know, buying someone a new car or whatever else that you've done, like your hands are really important. So I think, you know, being in the field that I'm at right now, you know, I do focus on like what my hands do and your hands can be your words, your hands can be your actions. But I think it's something that if you stop and really think about like what you've done with your hands in your life, you'll have a, a long list of things to be grateful for and a lot of lessons that you can learn. Perspective, very good perspective. Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I've, it, and a lot of stuff that you've talked about makes me, want to just take a step back, you know, the tragic accident with your father, I have a motorcycle, it makes me want to, I ride smart, trust me, but it, it is a reminder to ride smart. Sometimes you, you know, the story that you told today is a reminder to me to even more, you know, every time I hop on my bike and, and head out, don't take it for granted, things happen and, and, you, and you just don't know when it's going to happen. I, I've had a friend, uh, not a family member, I did have a very close friend take her life. And to always remember to, you know, those last words might just be the last words. Don't waste your time being mad or angry. It's just not worth it in the end. And my dad had a tile business and I grew up learning how to lay tile. That's how I had to earn money was use my hands. And I think that's probably why I have such an appreciation for what you do. Just is your hands. There's so many moments that you were talking today that just brought me back to really being so appreciative of what I have to to be smart, to be loving, to be kind, to, to, to pay it forward. I've learned just, I feel like this meant a lot to me personally, just because there's so many things you talked about that I can, I just had some type of connection with you. And 
everything you've said, every life lesson, every motivational thing, even when, when you went from down to up, I mean, you truly have such a story to it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, and the wild part is sometimes I feel like I'm just in the beginning too. Like it's still being written. There's still, you know, in my heart, there's still so much left to do. Um, so much more for other people um, that I think I'm going to accomplish in my life, whether it's through a nonprofit organization or just something that we do. Um, That's what I was going to say to you. What's next? <laughs> yeah, my wife and I, we've been talking about um, starting a nonprofit organization uh, together. She's in the aesthetic dermatology field. And so, you know, really helping restore people's life and people's homes. I think that's something that we've talked about as well, too. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. She wants to call out the beauty and the builder. So we're, we're, we're talking about that now. So we'll I see. I like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we took the website. So if anybody tries to steal the website, we own it already. But um, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, it's, it's, you know, we're renovating our own personal home now. I, I got to, I'm doing it myself. So I'm living through that at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us in the very near future to really be able to spread out, um, to be able to speak more on the things that we talked about, get to go into deeper lessons of all the lessons that I've learned in life, the strategies that we have to go through traumatic events, to be successful, to go through, you know, start your own business. There's a lot of opportunity for that. So um, I always tell everyone that we're, you know, we're starting to plan more speaking engagements and events and stuff. So if you want to connect with us, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll put the link to, uh, to our you yes. know, email and our website and stuff like that for us to be able to connect. I'd love to, to share my, our story in, in every way possible to as many people as possible. So we're always interested in being different podcasts and um, speaking engagements as well. I, I have to tell you again, everything Truett Taylor related, whether it be his, the construction, the podcast he talked about, um, whether to connect him, how to connect with him or his social media, it'll all be below us in the show notes. Um, so you can reach him. I think there's such extraordinary future for you and your wife when you do get the nonprofit started and you're up and running or, or whatever new program you do, please come back on. I will I help get the word back out. I, I just love these types of messages where we need more of these positive, um, uplifting, motivational messages. And, and, and Truett, you are nailing it. No pun Thank intended. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Bad. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on Shannon Confidential. This is one episode I'm going to have a delight in, in producing and getting back out there. You, I just feel like I'm going to walk a little lighter today, showing a little bit more appreciative, hug people a little more, send a couple of more pretty, really nice texts out to friends to show my appreciation. I, I've learned a lot today with you. I'm glad you are on. I hope you come back and I can't thank you enough for being my guest today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, 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 oh,